Major funding for the Colotti series was provided by the McCune Foundation. Out of wood and paint comes a powerful image of prayer and devotion. It's a spiritual tradition that reaches back almost four centuries. And the Santos have always reflected love, spirit, faith, hope, all of these things. They're actually kind of like family. They are New Mexico's Santos. Next on Colores. Con sus cantos penetrantes he adecuado espirituales. Alaban la Santa Tierra, que en de todos es la madre. The sacred art of the Santos speaks to us, into our hearts. They remind us of our humanity with the threads that bind us together. Respect and worship, loss and sorrow, hope and triumph, and family and love. They teach us grace in our daily lives. They guide us closer to God. We ask for their help in times of need, for they once walked the earth in human skin and know of our struggle. To Santa Barbara, we ask that she protect us against deadly lightning storms. San Isidro watches our fields and shows us how to be a good neighbor. San Jose protects our home. The saints are divine intermediaries, eyes that see our lives, ears that hear our prayers. They are members of our family, a divine presence that is alive in our past, present, and future. A santo is a saint, in essence, and an image of a saint in carving. A retablo is a painting on wood, and a bolto is a three-dimensional figure carved in the round from wood. It is very important for the New Mexican person to have some sort of symbol that illustrates their faith. And the santo is one way by which uh, that can be done. The saints are intermediaries, a physical link between mortals on earth and God in heaven. They are images of ordinary people that led exemplary lives with their dedication to Christianity. Blessed are the acts of the saints, for in turn, their acts bless the people. Listen to a story from long ago about a tradition long since past. The women of the village were up early on the 24th of June. At six o'clock they were bedding on the river or in the acequias, for on this day the waters and the streams were believed to be holy. Better help awaits those who rose early to wash or least their faces and feet in the holy water. For was it not San Juan who baptized Jesus and the river Jordan 
and bless their waters. A santo is a um, representation, a depiction of, um, of someone who actually lived and who led an exemplary life. It can also be an image of, um, of Mary or of uh, Jesus, angels, all of these. When I carve any image, any santo, I try to reflect on their life and on the good that they did. Think of those things as I'm carving, and it becomes kind of uh, a meditation, in a sense, a devotion. The art of the santo is a living history which began in the late 1500s. Before the first English colonists set sail for Jamestown, Spanish settlers brought their culture to this new world. When they came in in, in 1598 and they came into uh, this area right around Española, as a thanksgiving to God, the people built, the first thing they did was build their churches before even their houses or anything. They would build their church. Everything was tied around uh, the church life, the spiritual life, the faith in God the people had. Santos were created out of the necessity to adorn churches and home altars, crafted with the simple materials that the land provided, cottonwood, gesso, paint, and sweat. These saints provided a spiritual need for the settlers providing comfort and support to a people struggling in an unforgiving territory. A few santos were made in the early 1600s by Franciscan priests, but most of those were destroyed in the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. Spanish settlers returned 12 years after the revolt, but faced an uncertain future. Starvation, plague, and Indian raids were devastating during the period between 1750 and 1780. Finding the remote mountains of New Mexico difficult to defend, the Spanish government withdrew military support and with that, no longer replaced the Franciscan priests who were old and dying out. Through the struggle and hardship, the people held onto the santos for hope. It's one thing to pray to God and to ask God's forgiveness and blessing and so forth, but he's forbidding. He might be somewhat righteous. He's high above. He's hard to reach. But the saints were very, very human and personal. They could be touched. They knew what they looked like, like flowers. They were beautiful, and incidentally, one of the things I think is extremely important is that they were very isolated. They were lost in, the, in, this, in this continent of, of harsh adversity. They were struggling to endure. Consequently, here you have these people with very little outside influence building a kind of a linear, a kind of abstract, uh, complete novel art form. Late in the 1700s, a hard-fought prosperity came to northern New Mexico as more people settled in the region and the Indian Wars ended. The demand for santos rose and over the years santeros crafted the statues to reflect the simple life on the frontier, a life of struggle with clear expectations. There is great excitement in the village, for my cousin is to be married. It is a time of much feasting and joy. My cousin is busy now, for she promised St. Anthony that she would shower him with paper flowers if he fulfilled her prayer. 
and she's making them now to show her respect. Her prayer was this, Blessed Saint Anthony, three things do I ask, health, wealth, and a good husband. This kind of art is, in this small period of time, is so charged and so dynamic that it hardly has a counterpoint in any other folk art in the world. The individual Santeros, as we know them, the indigenous local artisans, the craftsmen, really began in New Mexico right around 1770. This art form is so distilled so purely, so simply, so directly, that it's an immediately appealing, that it becomes a flame, an incandescent flame. And that's why we love it. I greet the morning with thanks to God for another day. For each day is a blessing, a cycle of dawn and dust which turn the seasons. I greet Our Lady and San Rafael as I kneel each morning and light more candles. San Rafael brings good health and friendship to our home. San Rafael, protect my journey this day, my walk into the village. Well, Santos have a strong presence, a very strong presence even though they're simple images, they're very powerful, they um, can get your attention. That gaze that they, that they have out to, to the distance, they don't speak, but yet they do. One of the reasons that people have Santos in their house is to be able to have someone to express their devotion to. Uh, most generally, when you speak to a saint, you can put all your problems, lay all your problems at your little altar, your little devotional space, and then go on with your life. When the colonists were first in New Mexico, they, they really had nobody to turn to. There were Times were hard, it was a, a difficult living, Indian raids were ongoing, their safety was always in question, and so they had to have something that they could count on, and what they could count on always was their faith. The Santo tradition nearly died out with the dawning of the 20th century. The opening of the Santa Fe Trail allowed French archbishops to take over the church in New Mexico. The French clergy replaced the wooden santos with plaster statues. Those who protected the wooden santo tradition were the members of the Penitente Brotherhood, moral and devoted men who ministered to the needs of the isolated people when the Spanish clergy left. Demand for the wooden statues declined so much that they were dangerously few craftsmen to carry on the tradition. But the tradition did survive, and it changed. The 1920s saw a rise in tourism and an interest in folk art. The 1960s brought a renewed awareness and cultural pride. Art became a means for financial survival. Today, contemporary santeros carve for private clients, museums, and churches. One of the things that is important in, in trying to preserve a tradition is realizing that no matter how hard we try, we are still contemporary santeros because we're working in a contemporary period. We are in the present trying to preserve something that is traditional. And therefore, the way we do it has to be in our own style. There is now an effort underway to preserve the past by conserving old santos. It's a careful endeavor where faith meets science. I'm working on a santo, St. John the Evangelist. 
uh, which is in a fire and sustained some really bad heat damage. First of all, we had to find a substance that would remove the soot and the fallout from the paint layer. We found this substance called EDTA. It lets the soot and all that particulate matter of the, of the soot be collected all into one ion and that helped us to, to take off the, the soot and stuff like that from the paint air. This piece is really important to me in that working in this lab I got to touch a little piece of my history, a little piece of my culture and my heritage. Each santo has stylized attributes which represent important events in the life of the saint. To a people who could not read, these attributes were very important to identify the saints, but more so, the attributes served as lessons about right and wrong, about good and evil. San Miguel has a sword to conquer the forces of evil. He holds the scales of judgment as Lord of Soul. He weighs the deeds they are done in life and recommends heaven, purgatory, or hell. He protects against evil and is the patron of soldiers, police, those who are ill and is evoked during the temptations and at the time of death. He teaches justice and fairness. I think it's important for the, like for the Hispanic culture to see the agony and the emotion in these saints because they've lived a lot of this themselves. They've been through wars, they've been through pain, they've been through hurt, and it's important for them to see this in, in the images they, that they portray because it's truthful, you know. It's, it's something that, that's telling the truth. Christ, the Virgin Mary, the saints, all have their place in devotional places within our homes and church altars. Birth, death, and rebirth are played out as each village celebrates the feast of their patron saint. The church is the grounding force behind each community, connecting villages in time through the yearly cycle of worship. The saints have taught us to look for miracles in unexpected places. Roses miraculously grew in winter when Our Lady of Guadalupe appeared. Juan Diego heard a human voice, the sweet, gentle voice of a woman speaking in his own language. Juan, the voice said, Juan Diego. Juan Diego ran to the very top of the hill. As he got there, the cloud parted, and he saw the most beautiful lady dressed in the robes of a princess. Juan Diego threw himself down on his knees. The lady looked as if she was standing in front of the sun with light all around her. Everything gleamed and glistened as though made of precious jewels and gold. The Santos have heard the prayers of generations. Prayers for safety and health, to watch over children and protect the family. But sometimes, the answer to a prayer is no. It is common to place a statue of La Virgen Maria in our window to protect a loved one in a storm. One time, we put La Virgen in the window because my brother was in the storm. The next morning, her hair was gone. My brother was killed in the storm. Like members of a family, the saints can be serious, lighthearted, steadfast, or fickle. 
It was not uncommon for a saint to be turned to a wall as punishment for prayers unanswered, but there are some troubles beyond the control of either humans or santos. A story goes that a Pueblo Indian once tried to invoke San Isidro, the farmer, one summer to stop a plague of locusts that feasted on his crops. As was often the custom, the man dressed the santo in finery, a little jacket, a hat, and a pair of boots, and carried it into the center of the field where he left it. He expected to return the following morning and find his field completely free of locusts, but instead he found the statue of San Isidro, the farmer, completely naked, for the locusts, even more numerous than before, had devoured every stitch of the santo's clothing. Liberta nuestro sembrado, San Isidro labrado. There was somebody that said that the three most prized things in heaven are uh, a strong faith, a simple life, a simple life, and a helping hand. So you think about that, you know. We start feeling sorry for ourselves because we can't have everything that we see out there or the glamour, the beauty. Instead of just thanking God for the things that he does give us, for our health, for our families, for the food we have to eat. And if you don't, well, you could lose from one day to another all the food that we're eating. And all of a sudden you could find yourself homeless or you could find yourself in a, a victim of a flood, a victim of an earthquake, a victim of, of a fire, or a victim of violence. And these are things that, that we pray to the saints that they save us from these kind of things. And actually people would in the old days, they would take maybe a finger of a saint and crush that finger and throw it into the floodwaters and ask that saint to help them out, you know? And that is why they're so precious to us, you know? But it's just the simple, simple things. Seems almost like a prayer to to work with the peace that means so much to my religion and my, you know, my spirituality, and carving a new peace or restoring an old one. I think that you know it brings me great joy and and sometimes sadness and sometimes um, humility be able to work on a piece you know, that has so much power and so much grace.
And when the sixth hour had come, darkness fell over the whole land unto the night hour. And at the night hour, Jesus cried out, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? And Jesus cried out, and breathed his last. And the veil of the temple was turned in two from top to bottom.